Okay. Okay, thanks um, very much for that. This is a very quick um, scan of a book that um, I've been working on with uh, Susan Guthrie. It actually comes from an idea that I first had when I was on the um, tax working group, which is another one of those partial reviews of what the government does, tied down so strictly with terms of reference that its conclusions basically are irrelevant. Um, this particular formulation was formed on the back of any New Zealand sick bag, um, which as I was going to one of the meetings, so I thought it was so good that um, I needed to take it a bit more seriously and do a bit more work on it, and that has been the purpose of this book, where we have now um, looked at the fiscal tractability of it. So it's a combination of addressing two issues, really. One has to do with the capital productivity in New Zealand, um, and the other has to do with our redistribution via our tax and welfare. I call it, we call it tax and transfer, the tax and welfare system. And what we find um, with this set of policies is that we actually address the two things simultaneously. So I could come at this issue either way, through a capital markets perspective or through a distribution um, perspective. So just to keep us my own attention on the subject, I'm going to come at it from a distribution um, perspective. And the first question really is, what, what's happened here to our understanding of redistribution over the many decades of um, a mixed mode economy? Redistribution by the tax and transfer system was never about policies for the poor originally. The poor really are a subset of those on the receiving end of redistribution. They are not the whole story. They're a very important part of the story, but they're not the whole story. And unfortunately, the trend in policy that we see is that redistribution now is becoming more and more focused purely on the plight of the poor. And I think that's to the detriment of the coherence of the tax and welfare system. Redistribution is about giving everybody their birthright. It's about giving everybody the same chance to participate, to compete, and to live in dignity. It's essentially about building an economy based on meritocracy. Poverty absolutely is the worst, it is evidence of the worst, of, of, of the biggest sort of failure with redistribution. No argument about that. But it is the extreme case, which unfortunately, over recent governments in New Zealand has become the whole case. A burgeoning wealth disparity across your economy is actually the far more potent indicator of something wrong with your redistribution. We've got heaps of graphs on this. I'm just going to give you one for the sort of time I'm eating your lunch, literally, here. Um, and that is just to show you what has happened in this property market. This is a market that is driven solely by, I'm talking about your housing here, solely by speculation. It has nothing to do with the demand and supply for a roof over your head. You're a bunch of speculators. And that has become ingrained in the system of New Zealand now. And that's where our capital efforts have gone, and we have a lot to show in terms of the pace of our slide down the OECD league tables. We are outstanding in that regard. So the principles of a coherent redistribution regime are ones of vertical and horizontal equity. Vertical is really comes, if you go back far enough, it um, comes from Plato really, I guess, is where it starts, but it was very well enunciated by Adam Smith. And that is, if you have two people equally wealthy, <coughs> the person who's more valuable to society is the one who pays more tax. Not less, and I know our mission of course is to pay as little tax as we possibly can, legally. So we have got that totally out of our place. The concept of vertical equity where the rich 
pay proportionally more than before, or they're not so rich. Horizontal equity is where you have two people under um, some of the circumstances receive or contribute the same amount net to the redistributive system. And we can give you case after case after case in New Zealand where that is no longer the case, hasn't been for more than two decades. Adequacy is to do with those at the bottom of the heap must, in any society, have an adequate um, level of sustenance to live a dignified life. Efficiency is you must do all of this at the least possible, you know, um, call on with you. So dead weight loss and those sort of things in terms of administrators and, you know, power blocks full of bureaucrats to look behind the curtains to make sure you qualify for a benefit, that sort of thing, um, must be minimised. And cost speaks for itself. <coughs> on all counts, our current regime has failed and failed terribly over now many decades. We have what's called the social assistance model of social transfer in New Zealand, which means unless you qualify sufficiently as a beggar, you shouldn't get transfers. And we hope that our bureaucrats know how to just differentiate a beggar uh, between a beggar and somebody who's just ripping off the system. A fat chance. It's incredibly costly. And it's also highly judgmental in terms of picking winners and losers in this theatre. So I'm now going to give you a graph that's going to break your brain. <laughs> so I wish I'd sort of done this just after lunch, but never mind. Hopefully we'll get you through there. Three dimensions, all right? You're not seeing things. <coughs> so here is the, the, you know, the zero point on the axis. We go up here, the wealthier you are. This is to do with families in New Zealand, this graph. We could do it for individuals, but this is families. The wealthier you are, you travel up this way, towards this column, this, this axis, all right? The more income you have, we're only doing wages here, you travel that way. So if you're out on this point, you have maximum income, but no wealth. Everybody with me? And if you're at that point over there, you have maximum income and maximum wealth. I'm just trying to get you. I could have bought the 3D glasses, but no. <laughs> Okay, so this is the existing <laughs> regime. My first point is that if you're on an income, family income that's about 40 grand at least, doesn't matter what your wealth is, you are a net beneficiary from the transfer system. Okay? So if you've got a million, two million dollars, you are a bludger. Absolutely. This is the current system. If you have, now this is the one that you're going to struggle with, this point here, remember, down this axis, is maximum wealth and maximum income. So on the concept of vertical equity, this is the person or family who can afford to transfer the most, right? make the biggest contribution to the tax and benefit system. But you'll notice off this graph that they don't actually contribute the most. The vertical axis, remember, is the how much you contribute or take from the system. The people who, contri uh, who contribute the most are, the, are out here. See, that's a bit higher than that. They're the people with the highest income, but low wealth. Okay. So if we're talking about vertical equity, which means from each according to his means to each according to his needs, basically is what it means, then we've got it wrong, haven't we? Because the guys that should be paying the most are here. The guys, obviously, that should be receiving the most, we've got that bit, right, are here. But certainly these ones shouldn't be net recipients. These ones here with very high wealth and no income. Let me put it in English for you. It is very simple for me to avoid tax in New Zealand. It's just a joke. All, right? All I have to do is go and buy myself half a dozen mansions around the country, I don't put people in them, for Christ's sake, you know, I don't make carpets dirty. I just hold them, and I rely on your speculative demand to drive the property prices through the roof. Thank you very much. 
been going on now for nearly three decades. It's, it's called a misallocation of capital. And with that comes very poor productivity and very poor income generation. Now this is the regime that Susan and I have come up with. And I've just got those and get past that. You can see that this is perfect. <laughs> this is indeed a beautiful thing. <laughs> the people paying the most have high wealth and high income. The people receiving the most in terms of transfers from the rest of us have as <coughs> now. The lowest on both counts. But the people who have no income, like me, and heaps of wealth, actually contribute. I can hear you now saying, well, shouldn't that actually be even more? <laughs> <laughs> have that debate later. <laughs> At least it's a start. <laughs> Very different regime. This is a revolution in our tax and transfer system. And it is not shagging around with a marginal change at the, at the, um, at the, you know, at the border. This is tough. This is the difference between the two curves. I gave you one. The existing gave you the proposed. This is the proposed minus the existing. So in fact the ones that have the biggest percentage change are here. Other ones I talked about before. High wealth, no income. They actually, under our regime, pay a shitload more. And all of these ones up here essentially are benefit, beneficiaries of the change. Bad use of the word beneficiary. I don't mean quite that. Don't take the wrong connotation. So everybody on low wealth, <coughs> up to 400 grand, these families, 4 to 500, I call them low wealth, right, in terms of net, if net equity, they are all benefit from this regime. This is a major transfer. And it ticks the boxes on all things, vertical and horizontal equity, um, adequacy, and you'll see in a minute, deficiency. Alrighty. Here's the proposal. Get your sick bags ready. <laughs> First thing, we have one rate of tax on income. We've set it, this thing is fiscally neutral. So we've set it to make it fiscally neutral at 30%. If you want to change things, you can put it up or down, but you have to change other things and the government says that you know, we've changed fiscal neutrality. Right. So one rate of tax from even the first dollar you earn. 30%. Doesn't matter what entity you are, whether you're a trust, a company, a person. That really, when you boil it down, is the size of our government. There's a way to think about it. A capital tax, not a capital gains tax. So very different to what Labour are talking about. This is a tax you levy on capital every year. And you levy it assuming that the capital earns a minimum rate of return. So you're demanding of your capital an efficiency in terms of its deployment. Okay? <coughs> that rate of return We've set at 6%, which happens to be the average bond rate, the government stock rate for the last 10 years. What do I mean by capital? I don't mean money in the bank. <coughs> money in the bank is already taxed. I don't mean shares. What I mean is, for those of you who are business people, is the non-current assets on your balance sheet. Those are the cap items of capital you apply to produce income. So they would include land, buildings, structures, software, equipment. They're what an economist thinks of as capital to produce goods and services. So if we're saying there's a minimum required rate of return of 6%, we're going to tax that at the standard rate, 30%. That's the government's share it. It's 30 times 6 is 1.8% per annum. Each and every year, whether you're buying and selling the capital as a well to this. 
Now this tax is creditable if you're already making more than 6%. You will pay on your assets. You will pay no more tax at all. So it's creditable only against the capital tax that effectively you're paying now, which you're paying, of course, for income tax on that. So if you've got a company making a 10% rate of return and owns all those assets, it won't pay a cent more. It pays exactly what it's paying now. So the income tax for the owners of capital becomes a tax on the difference. So over and above what they've already had to pay on the capital tax. Next thing, which I know will have wide appeal, no exemption whatsoever for owner-occupied housing. That is actually the troublemaker here. So to exempt it is a political stuff. I mean, politics is the art of the possible. I'm not interested in the possible. I'm interested in what you should do. So no exemption whatsoever. So if you own a million dollar house, you have to pay whatever that is. That's 2% of a million dollars. A lot of money. <laughs> yeah, okay. So sell a million dollar house, get yourself an $800,000 one and put 200 in the bank. It's about portfolio construction. <coughs> Instead of having 100% in one asset type because you're a speculator rampant, as you seem to be acknowledging, um, I'm asking you to have a more balanced portfolio because what you're doing is actually destroying the productive capacity of this economy. So no exemptions whatsoever for speculators. All benefits get abolished. You don't know if we're left or right here, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure you were right. Or correct. A unit, um, an unconditional <laughs> basic income. Everybody, every adult gets it. 11,000 a year after tax. So we've got a, we've got a married couple of people here, they're getting 22,000. Eight and a half to youth, which is Susan, what, 18 to 20? Yeah, 18 to 20. So in effect, you don't pay tax here until you earn 37,000. Anybody done got their head around that? Because what's happening is you're getting the first 11,000 tax free. You're being taxed at 30%, 30% under 11,000, whatever it is, 36, 37,000, before you actually pay a cent of tax. Talk about the funding side of it, because it's. The government's share of GDP under this proposal goes down. Not up. And that's because you abolish the need for all those bureaucrats administering MSD. Not all of them, but a few of them. Enough to have a tangible effect on GDP, actually. <laughs> GDP is a weird measure, eh? That's what you consider production. <coughs> Very sick. Um, <laughs> government transfers do, but government's just the agent between you and me. I'm transferring to you or you're transferring to me. It's just the age of the trends. The transfers definitely go from whatever to the 35 to and we are things. But all you're doing is taking from one point to the other across the economy. You're not leaking it out to government GDP to the government. <coughs> I'm sure you're interested to see who wins and who loses under this. Well, I don't know if you can read quite, but um, these are sort of different um, types of you know, single people and families. So families fall on the average way, still win it, um, to about 10% boost and so on. Two big losers. First is sole parents. This is just, if we were to do this tomorrow, who would be the big loser? Sole parents would be a big loser. Here. And the other big losers, which I'm actually very pleased about, are superannuants. Superannuants receive in New Zealand by far the biggest transfers, by a mile. It's, it's actually formed the benchmark for all other transfers, and quite frankly, it's disgusting that I get um, 
a transfer just because of my age, given my wealth. It's nuts. So I don't have any sympathy with this. We'll fix this one. I haven't done any policy reaction. So overall, that to me looks quite good. So let's just deal with the sole parent thing first. We would change, I mean you've got a whole lot of things here, but here's the sort of things you would might think of. Change child support so it comes out of the um, unconditional income of the, the one that's slung the hook. And you know, left, left the tent. Then rather than rely on the government to stand in the middle for you and I to stand in the middle and do that. Um, it comes directly from the source. They can also, of course, go to Australia then it's a different thing. This policy actually encourages sole support. When we really looked at the sole parent thing, we thought, this is nuts. Because there's so many add-on benefits now for sole parents, they end up actually doing quite well in the scheme of things. And you know what we're trying to do? We're trying, they get together, they have their babies and all that stuff, right? and they have a certain standard of living. And then they decide, well, it's time to head for the hills or green pastures or whatever. <coughs> what we try to do is we try to replicate the standard of living that they had when they were together for a sole parent, you know, by giving them a basic income and then the accommodation top-ups and so on. Why would you do that? I mean, I can understand why you don't want them Parent going down the, you don't want them going down the toilet. I right? understand that, but you don't want to remove the incentives for them to say link up with other parents in the same. But they get the same economies of scale. In other words, on their housing, in other resources. That's ridiculously wasteful of uh, resources. So what we're really saying here is calling the resources part-time work. I take that or leave it. The important thing for me is calling the resources so that you actually have a system that encourages the people who find themselves in that situation to share resources with other like things. We haven't ruled out the possibility of a UBI, uh, uh, unconditional income for children. Remember, some of you remember the family benefit. This is a hell of a lot bigger. <coughs> um, if we were to make that three grand a child, that would require the tax rate, just to give you an idea of the cost of it, that tax rate to go from 30 cents on the dollar <coughs> to 32. There's a whole lot of things, levers you can play with in here to get this far more palatable. For the, this is a very small cohort of the population, by the way. It's extremely small. You don't hold your whole system hostage to trying to pick up the last loser, for God's sake. And putting in a, putting in a, set, a set of supports where actually the dead weight loss of doing it far, far exceeds the benefit of you receiving it. You know, you've got to keep things sensible. Let's talk about the old folks, because some of us are heading there pretty quick. You can, with your capital, comprehensive capital tax obligation, which you have to pay every year, it's just like rates, you can defer it. Right? Um, just like a reverse mortgage. So you can eat your house in other words. Okay, so the government just well, you get your timing right, you've got to get the date of death right on this. <laughs> but, um, you can, you know, um, you can, you know, chew up the house before the kids get it. <laughs> you can of course downsize your accommodation costs. That was the question, that was the point the gentleman here raised when he was in the house. And I said, well, you know, make it eight hundred and use the two hundred to generate the cash flow. Of course, you all have very handsome TV show balances <laughs> uh, anyway. But also, don't forget the Cullen Fund. A lot of money, it's sitting there, it's completely redundant in this model. So you can use that to affect the transition from old folks from the current scheme to the new scheme. Last slide. Why are we doing this? To give everybody in New Zealand the same opportunity not to lock out people because of their birth circumstances. So that meritocracy rules. A dignified life in a society like this is actually a birthright. So the unconditional basic income should be a birthright. Birthright. 
Why do we say at the moment that the only actual activity that's worth anything in this country is one that attracts paid income? What about all the people who are in the volunteer sector, running either looking after their own children, other people's children, old folks, whatever they're doing? Surely that's part of the production in this economy, and surely it deserves some sort of formal recognition. That's exactly what the UBI is there for. It gives you a choice whether you want to be in the paid workforce or not. At the moment, the choice is if you don't want to be in it, mate, then you have nothing, and you have to then throw yourself on the um, you know, MSD thing in terms of you know, qualifying to be poor enough to get a benefit. That's just nuts. I mean, when do we get to this point where we can actually have a basic income? You know, are we not going to do it till we're all zillionaires? See the problem here. But, you know, despite what's been said in this, in this room earlier today, incomes in this country per capita are miles above what they were 50 years ago, miles above what they were 100 years ago. And yet we're still saying that work for paid work, you actually worth nothing in this economy. We have an amazing stigmatisation between the two sectors. <coughs> Crazy. And the other thing that we're attacking in the same brush is to try and deal with this terrible misallocation of capital in New Zealand. Where, you know, we're not even making the rate of return that I can make off government, government stock. So we need to utilise our capital a lot more. This taxes misallocated capital really quite nicely. It doesn't tax profitable capital um, anymore at all. And it's already been. Is it respectable, this policy? Murley's report, which is the major um, report on the tax and transfer system in the UK a couple of years ago, defines this basically as the holy grail of integrating your tax and transfer system. Thank you very much.